Distribution fitting is an art, and it's quite a difficult art that requires a lot of statistical knowledge. On this video, we will tackle all the ideas surrounding this topic, so let's get started. Imagine you have a model that has a process that a thousand people need to go through, so you will have a thousand waiting times, and you know that each person will wait a different amount of time. So the question we want to ask is, how much is that waiting time? And if we have empirical data, you can answer this question because you know how much time people wait. If you have a hundred waiting time samples and a thousand waiting times that need to be occurring in the simulation, so what do you do? That is the question we need to answer here. One very dumb thing that you can do is to just copy paste the 100 data points that you have and create a thousand data points. This is very easy to do, but causes a lot of problems. So this is something that you definitely almost never should do. So we will talk on this video on what kind of things you should do in these cases. How do you fit a distribution? And if you cannot fit a distribution, what should you do about it? Okay, so let's talk about goodness of fit, which is how close a model or a statistical model is to your empirical data. This is generally the idea that we will talk about on this video. And on any model you create, there's always at least one random element that exists. And in general, you have multiple stochastic variables that exist in your system and you need to understand what these values are and you generally need a distribution to explain them, whether it is a discrete distribution or a continuous distribution. So you need to understand your statistics. So whenever you use data, you need to understand the behavior of this data. We'll talk about that. You need to understand the frequency, how often something happens in the data, and you need to understand the nature. For example, if it's discrete or continuous. On this video, we'll only talk about, about continuous and we'll ignore discrete distributions, for example, Poisson. So, what are the necessary steps for this? In any data science endeavor, and in particular fitting a distribution, you need to follow different steps. For this video, we will ignore everything related to data cleaning and data collection and all that kind of stuff. We'll assume that we have a clean data set that we can use and it's useful, okay? So we will talk about data visualization. So how does the data look like? We will talk about descript descriptive analysis. So all the elements, statistical elements that are related to our empirical data. And finally, we'll talk about different topics surrounding distribution fitting. Okay, so let's get started with data visualization. The two most typical things you need to start your work is box plots and histograms. If you don't know any of this, you should go back and start learning this because this is basic to understand your distributions. There are different biases that we want to, to tackle. For example, outliers. In the box plot, it's very easy to see these outliers. And we want to use this box plot also to understand how your, your data, data behaves and looks like. The histogram also gives you a lot of information. And there are a lot of different biases. For example, sampling bias would be to have a sample of a particular branch of a particular uh, company, and we use the waiting times in a one process in that branch, and we would use the distribution in another branch that may have a different process. That's a potential bias of sampling. And there's other many other variable biases that we won't touch. We will talk only about outliers. Also, you need to understand the skewness that will tell you a little bit about the shape of 
the distribution that you should use. We'll talk about that in a bit. Okay, so let's talk about the most common reasons for outliers. One of them is the initial conditions. For example, if you have a, a waiting line and a, some people doing processes and the system fails, there's a spike in these waiting times and this might be taken as an initial condition that raises the times. This will be outliers, right? Another one is natural variation. Some things that may look like outliers might not be because it's the natural state of things. Another one, which is the most typical one, in my experience, is incorrect data collection or corrupted data. Even if you, ha if you have very clean data, it's possible that the data is corrupted and no cleaning process will tell you that. So what do you do and what is the solution? If you have incorrect data collection, you should definitely remove that data from your data set. That's quite obvious. If you have natural variation, you might not want to remove that data or that outliers because they belong to the system that you're trying to analyze. But you, if you have unusual conditions, you might want to think if you want to remove them or not, depending on the context of the case. Okay, so let's talk about descriptive analysis. Descriptive analysis is related to the stats of your data. So, for example, how many samples you have, what is the standard deviation, the mean, different percentiles, the median. All these things tell you things about the data and you can mix this with your visualization analysis. So you have additional information in your visualization that gives you an idea on how the distribution works. So all these two things work together. Something that is important is to experience the data and how does it work in real life. A lot of times the data is quite contextual and the context allows you to understand better what kind of distribution you should use. Another one is the theory. You need to understand all the statistical tools and understand distribution fitting in general in order to be able to do this work correctly. And finally, the data itself. You need to understand the nature of the data, where it comes from, and those three things together will give you an experience and a better understanding of how you fit this data into a particular distribution. Okay, let's talk now about distribution fitting. So we talk about suggestions here because we can only suggest distributions. Distribution fitting is a bit of an art. There's no button or unique algorithm that will tell you exactly with the, like pressing a button, what the distribution is based on any data that you might have. So you need to do a lot of inference. So let's talk about some elemental things. For example, what if the mean is far from the median? You will see immediately that the distribution is skewed. So you want to use skewed distributions, for example, log normal, exponential, triangular, etc. On the other hand, if the mean is similar to the median, you might know that the data is symmetrical. So you might want to use a symmetrical distribution, for example, normal, uniform, triangular, etc. These distributions are some examples and there are many, many, many more. Another thing that is important to understand is the coefficient of variation. The coefficient of variation explains the dispersion of the data around the mean. This is important and we'll see why. It's very easy to calculate. You calculate the standard deviation divided by the mean. That's it. So what are possible results knowing the coefficient of variation? One of them is that if the coefficient of variation is below one, you might want to use a gamma or weighable distribution with a shape parameter above one. If it's equal to one, you might want to use exponential distribution. And if it's above one, you might want to use the gamma or weighable distribution with a shape parameter below one. 
So isn't this enough? Well, I don't think so, because you need to do a lot more to really know what distribution fits your data correctly. So there are a set of tools that you can use, and this takes probably a, a full course in order to understand all these tools, but we're talking here about the basics, okay? There's also the idea of application cases. Application cases are very important because they are contextual. There's a lot of literature that tells you what kind of application cases allow a distribution of a particular kind. In a way, you can say that if you think about inter-arrival times, you might want to use an exponential distribution or something similar to that. If you are thinking about waiting times, you might want to use a symmetrical distribution, for example, normal. So they're all contextual. Without even knowing about the data, I can only already inf infer what kind of distribution I need. It's also very important to understand the all distributions that exist, or at least the most popular ones, and understand their shapes. The more you understand about distributions, the more you're able to see the data and infer what kind of distribution would fit more with this particular set of data, okay? So this is something to study. We're not going to look at this on this video. Let's go back to the goodness of fit. Remember, if you have distribution, the goodness of fit will tell you how close the distribution is to the empirical data. And we can see this by looking at the differences between these two things, right? So what you want to discover is if these differences are small enough in order to accept the hypothesis that the a distribution fits the data, okay? So the question is, are these differences really significant? And there are a bunch of tests that you can do, for example, G squared, Kolmogorov, Smirnov, or Anderson Darling. These are three examples that have their pros and cons when it comes to, to see if a distribution fits your data. And there are a lot more of these tests. You generally want to use many of these tests when you decide what distribution to use. And this is part, in part of particular interest when you want to communicate this to knowledgeable people that know about statistics so you have a story to tell on why you chose a particular distribution over another. So it's important to know your tests. And these are just examples. So the ways to do it, you can use Excel, you can use pen and paper, you can use Python, R, or any statistical package. Some universities teach you do how to do this test manually in order to understand the algorithms and everything that lies behind these tests. If you are interested in that, you should definitely learn it. But in general, you might just want to use some of the statistical packages in Python or R and forget what happens behind. Okay, so what options we have when it comes to choosing a distribution? You can simplify a lot, you can be very detailed, or you can be on the middle term. Let's talk about simplifying a lot. We simplify a lot when we don't have enough data. For example, if you want to know in a process how long does it take for a mechanic to change a tire, you don't have that data available in any system. So you want to do is to go to the mechanic and ask him, how long does it take? And the mechanic will tell you a minimum, uh, an average that you can translate as mode, or an, a max. So you can use that information to have a, a very simplified model on what the distribution is. If you have more mechanics, you can add to that information. So triangular distributions are very good when you don't have a lot of data. 
The second one is to be very detailed. If you're an AnyLogic user, this is very similar to using custom distributions. So what you do here is to just take the empirical data and you use that directly by organizing them by on, on order and create a cumulative density function that will allow you by using linear interpolation to generate a sample of that data. So you can do that. And we'll talk a bit more about this in a bit. And the other one is what we have been talking so far, which is you have a distribution that will fit the empirical data and our objective is to choose a distribution that fits well. Now, this method is completely inferential and it's an art, as we said before. Okay, so let's talk about pros and cons. When you don't have a lot of data and you don't have a lot of time or you are a beginner, a simple distribution is much easier to use. Beginners love triangular distributions and uniform distributions because it's quite simple to use them. Nevertheless, the con is that for critical process, it might result in incorrect results. Also, the parameters are quite subjective. Asking a mechanic how much time does it take to change a tire might have different answers in different days. Also, you don't have values outside the ranges that you choose. Now, let's talk about fitting a distribution. The good thing about it is that it's a very generalized way of creating realistic values. So this is the best you can use to create realistic values. The con is that you require a lot of extensive knowledge of statistics, statistical tests, and so on. So you need a lot of education, but if you have it, then it's not a con anymore. Sometimes with large samples, it takes a lot of time to fit these distributions. So sometimes it might not be worth it. Now let's talk about empirical distribution. Empirical distribution is great when you have a few data available. And the good thing is that it doesn't require analysis at all. This is kind of the lazy way of doing distribution fitting because you just put the data into your system and it's very easy to get a sample of this data using the system that you're using. For example, if you use any logic, a custom distribution, very easy to use. Doesn't require you to think at all. So it's also very useful when you are not able to feed your data with any known probability distribution. So in that case, it's a good idea to use this. The problem is that it might be very specific. So for example, if you have your data in, on the, in the winter and then you want to use the same empirical distribution on the summer, you might have it wrong. And since empirical distribution doesn't require you to think at all very much, you might have this bias. When you fit a distribution, you need to think a lot about the context. So it's less likely that you make such a mistake. And anyways, if you have empirical distribution, you don't use values that are outside of the range that the data has, and that might cause problems too. So these are the pros and cons for all these options. Okay, so there we are. I hope this video brought you some light on how to do distribution fitting, or if you want to learn more, what to start learning and give you a general idea on the topic and how to apply it in your simulation models in the future. So that's it. See you on the next one.